Hello, hope you're all okay. Uh, so today I want to go through representation for your coursework. Uh, this is one of the key areas you will need to construct and encode in order to get some of that 30%. Um, the slides in the PowerPoint have been updated, so hopefully that should be showing up. If it's not, then I'll take you through it here and then I'll update it on the Google Classroom. Um, so firstly, I want you to think about how you want to represent your star. So in Media Studies at A-Level, we always say that representation is really representation. Um, and I think I've said this to my classes before, um, where I've asked who looks the same now as they did when they first woke up. Uh, and the point of this is to show you that every single one of us chooses to filter how we show ourselves to the world. And when you construct a media text, you're really just doing this on a much bigger scale for an audience um, with the aim of creating a profit and with the aim of um, building a loyal audience. Um, so in terms of areas of representation, you first of all have to represent your star. Uh, both the briefs, film and magazine this year state that you need to have at least one cover star on the front of your piece of media. So that's the front cover for your magazine or the DVD front cover and your two posters for your film. So you need to represent your star, you then need to construct your genre. Both briefs also state that you have to construct a representation of at least one social group. So this could be related to class, um, it could be related to religion, uh, gender, age group, or political issue perhaps, or something to do with sexuality or LGBTQ causes. This means that the visual media you create should encode your meaning clearly. So that means uh, your facial expressions, body language, gesture codes, uh, anchorage with another person or anchorage with text or sound, mise-en-scene, costume, colour palette, mode of address should all be very clear and what we call unambiguous. So there shouldn't be any double meaning unless it is deliberately constructed by you as a producer and you can demonstrate that this is an existing convention of the type of media that you are going to create. It's really important that with each piece, you build a representation of a social group that encourages the audience to accept your preferred reading. So very few people want to construct a piece of media with the aim of the audience having an oppositional reading. You want the audience to agree with the point of view you put across. Moving on from that, once you've researched and chosen your genre and your audience, you should decide who you're going to represent in your pieces. And by this, I mean, uh, choose a subsection of your target audience. So both the film and the magazine brief this year um, are aimed at an 18 to 35 year old audience. The best thing to do, uh, we tend to advise, is to choose, like I said, a subsection of that uh, age bracket because largely 18 year olds don't usually have the same interests as 35 year olds so your work should reflect this if you're aiming at 18 to 24 year olds that piece of media is going to be different to a piece of media that is aimed at 25 to 30 year olds or 30 to 35 year olds based on the cultural competence of the audience and the kinds of people that they interact with the kinds of role models uh, and cultivated ideologies that they tend to subscribe to you need to research how your social group is encoded by your industry and what is the most up-to-date stereotype of that social group. So, for example, 10, 15 years ago, representations of perhaps Arab nations in American media will have been highly negative um, to match the anti-Al-Qaeda, anti-Taliban representations that were um that were prevalent in society after the 9-11 bombings. Uh, if you were to look at more recent representations, however, you might find more pluralistic representations, particularly of Arabic women, um, as Western society and particularly Western um, media industries start to employ more people from these, uh, these niches of, of our society. If, for example, you're also looking at representation of age, you might decide to stray slightly away from um, 
film or TV and look at TV programs such as Sex Education or perhaps Stranger Things that again show really pluralistic and alternative representations of uh, teenagers in a non-judgmental light. Uh, you then need to state in your statement of aims if you're going to construct a hegemonic version of your chosen group or if you're going to subvert and challenge this. So are you going to go with the norms that are encoded in these texts or are you going to challenge those norms? Remember for the magazine brief, you're producing a mainstream product so you're not going to be subverting or challenging these mainstream representations. Instead, you're going to be constructing them and therefore you'll be re reinforcing those mainstream values. I'm going to go into in a little bit of detail um, a couple of representations of different people in a bit. So I'll explain to you what I mean by this. Your research into representations will be evident in your final work as your images should match mainstream zeitgeist norms and values. Now, if you can't remember what the word zeitgeist means, I advise you to Google it. Um, it basically just means the culture of the time. So it's another way of saying cultural competence or cultural capital. You could also say cultural zeitgeist. If you wish to challenge or subvert your chosen area of representation, you must provide evidence of at least two mainstream products that have done this in order to prove that you have minimized that risk of financial failure. So once again, you might choose to create a magazine aimed at teenage women and you might have the girl who plays Maeve in sex education um, on the cover or somebody like that in your research to demonstrate that these representations do exist. In terms of a film brief, the film brief requires you to encode Britishness in some form. So your research, if you choose this brief, should therefore explore how the specific form of Britishness is hegemonically represented in film. So if you're going to do a period drama and once lockdown ends, go up to Lime Park, borrow the costumes and make something like The Favourite, which is this film that Olivia Colman won her Oscar for two years ago, um, you would need to demonstrate through your research how Britishness and the notion of class in Britain is encoded in those texts. You could also do something more like This is England or Control, where you focus on working class uh, Britishness, or you could go with historical Britishness and look at something like Pride, which is a film uh, that focuses on the LGBT marches and um, the AIDS epidemic that was just starting up in the early 80s. Um, can you unpick the rules or those codes and conventions of how this social group is encoded to an audience? So I'm going to show you how to do that in a little bit. For example, if you are looking to represent lower class or working class social groups, you might decide to place them in front of a high rise block of flats, say in the centre of Stockport, um, wearing sportswear or casual clothes, perhaps with a bike, um, perhaps with heavy gold jewellery or other indicators of class and wealth. The hairstyles that you choose might also encode that um, just to construct that representation for the audience. As you find the representations that you want to recreate, it's important to ask why that person or social group has been encoded this way. And that is a lesson that really you need to be taking on board for every part of this course. You have to be asking why things are being done. OK, um, who is the producer and what messages are they sending the audience? So how do they benefit from constructing this representation? For example, mainstream producers such as Condé Nast benefit from reinforcing those hegemonic or mainstream norms of gender because it gives audiences those impossible ideals to chase. This then means that they are more likely to keep on buying that product as they believe that um, repeat purchases of a particular product, whether it's a magazine, whether it's a hair care product, whether it's a brand of clothing, they believe that it will bring them closer to, um, to that particular person. Okay, so whether it's Kylie Lip Kits or whether it's a particular sports brand um, or a particular leisure wear brand or a particular designer brand, say Balenciaga, Valentino, Gucci, um, all of that, we do it because we feel like it brings us closer to the stars that we emulate. So in terms of the task I needed to complete this week and here's just for Sheena's classes, I needed to collect a range of representations of the social group you've decided to encode and please try to select images that are targeted at your target 
audiences. Please also try and make sure that these range of representations are part of your brief. So we're looking at magazine covers, film posters, um, DVD covers, double page spreads, advertorials, if you can find them. Deconstruct the representations using your mise-en-scene editing, sound, camera skills, anchorage, semiotics, um, language, and analyse how these images construct that selected version of reality. So we're looking at media languages and how they construct that representation. So Baudrillard would be key here. Think of commenting on any rules you can see emerging from your research about how that social group is represented to an audience. So I'm going to show you two pictures in a bit of a star and I'm going to show you how he's presented to two different audiences. Uh, I'm then going to ask what binaries do the representations you collect create and what is the other side of that binary? So for that, let me just... Um, go through, first of all, the representation theory. And these are the bullet points that um, we've given you this year. They should be in your representation book. They're also in the back or the front of some of your topic booklets as well. So our representation theorists are Stuart Hall, David Gauntlet, Lisbeth Van Zunen, Bell Hooks, Judith Butler, and Paul Gilroy. Stuart Hall says that the idea that representation is the production of meaning through language, with language being defined in its broadest sense as a system of signs. So that is basic semiotics. Um, so we're talking enigma codes, action codes, um, the shape of clothing. So boys might decide to wear baggier clothes um, or tighter jeans, depending on what social groups they consider themselves to be a part of. Um, women in your social group or women in your target audience, depending on their age, might decide to wear either 90s influenced jeans, oversized sweatshirts, scrunchies in the hairs, we're talking like visco girls, or they might at the upper end of that target audience have a slightly more polished appearance, slightly more perhaps like Khloe Kardashian. Um, the idea that the relationship between concepts and signs is governed by codes. So, um, we use codes as a way of understanding both people and also what their beliefs are. Uh, so he would say, personally, Stuart Hall, that stereotyping reduces people to a few simple characteristics or traits. So those signs or codes reduce people to a two-sided representation, which is then easier for the audience to understand if we look at them quickly. So for film posters in particular, we tend to go past those at bus stops. So we need the representations that we construct to get across to the audience as quickly as possible. It's the same with um, magazines. If you think about magazines, they're normally displayed on the shelf, stacked five uh, in a row, and you can only normally see the top third of that magazine. So mostly we look for the masthead first, or we might look for a star if we are aware that star is starring in a particular magazine that month. Um, those representations, again, have to be very, very concrete and unambiguous because research has shown that on average, we look at a magazine cover for five seconds before we move on. Um, Stuart Hall also says that stereotyping tends to occur where there are inequalities of power. Now, if you are doing the film brief, this might be of particular interest to you. It would be nice if you could show an inequality of power, perhaps through race, class or religion, if you were doing the film brief. Moving on from that, David Gauntlet says that the media provides us with tools that we use to construct our identities and that while in the past, the media tended to convey singular, straightforward messages, today they offer us a diverse range of stars, icons and characters from whom we may pick and mix different ideas. So your key words for David Gauntlet are tools, construct our identities, singular and straightforward messages and also pick and mix. Uh, the binary opposite of singular is pluralistic, so you may also choose to use that word when you discuss your representations in relation to David Gauntlet. Uh, again, if you were doing the film brief, you might decide to do a period drama. If you're doing something that was set in perhaps the 50s or 60s, aimed at a slightly older audience, uh, you might use the um, 
the housewife stereotype or the um, the businessman stereotype, that kind of ABC one, husband and wife, very heteronormative representation. Uh, it's worth perhaps looking at programmes like The Americans for that or also The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Lisbeth Van Zunen says that gender is just constructed through discourse. So that means that gender is constructed through our speech and that our speech varies according to cultural and historical context. So linking in with Gauntlet and uh, Stuart Hall, you would use Van Zunen to demonstrate that historical representations of your particular social group, age, gender or class um, are different to how they are now, and you might also choose to discuss how um, men and women are looked at differently in the narrative of the text that you're looking at. So again, we're going to look at Chris Hemsworth in a bit, and I'll show you um, images of Chris Hemsworth, and then I'm going to show you Beyonce, and we'll look at how women tend to be objectified, whereas males are also objectified, but they're also constructed as a spectacle and are much more active than women. I'll come back to the theory in a bit because I'm aware that this is kind of getting quite heavy now. These can stay up on your screen. You can, like I said, pause this, go back to it, whatever you want to do with it. For now, I want to show you these images of Chris Hemsworth. So first, here we have Chris Hemsworth's Thor workout. Um, those of you that are doing a magazine, if you decide to do a magazine aimed at uh, perhaps 18 to 25 year old men or even 25 to 35 year old men, you might see some, decide to use something like men's health um, as your um, influencing uh, magazine. It's produced by Hearst, who are a mainstream uh, conglomerate. So this would be well within your remit for this particular brief. So we can see Chris Hemsworth here lit from the left. So that chiaroscuro creates these kind of planes and angles over the muscles. So we can see that muscular definition. We can see the veins popping on the arms. So we have all of these indicators of masculinity. You can see how the shoulder of that t-shirt is slightly tight, indicating that the muscles are big. We can again see that the pectoral muscles are also lifted, showing that this is a very muscular representation of a heterosexual male. We can also see that direct mode of address with that clenched jaw. So this is a very serious, almost confrontational mode of address, which is aimed to aimed at creating a representation of strength. You will also see that the uh, camera is slightly below eye level. If you were to draw a straight line between the lens of the camera and the star, we would probably hit round about his shoulder or his tricep, which then anchors with the feature that says build arms like this, get the Hemsworth plan for godlike strength with the arrow pointing directly at the tricep. So build arms like this is the biggest text on the page aside from the masthead. The arrow and the words Hemsworth and godlike also create anchorage with the star. We have Chris Hemsworth's name up in the banner as well, along with the word Thor. So we are constructing an unambiguous representation of this man. We understand from the word Thor that he is an actor. We also understand that he is an action star. From words like workout um, and again, words like godlike and strength. Uh, we then see swap fat for ripped. So um, although we do have Chris Hemsworth here as, a, uh, as an active male, uh, we can't see his fist at the bottom of the image, but we are assuming it's clenched because we can see the tricep definition there. Uh, by use of the word fat, we are constructing um, perhaps a negative mindset for for men who read this magazine and the belief that buying this magazine will help you upgrade yourself. So for most men's magazines, the notion is one of upgrading yourself from the person you are now to the person you will be in 30 days time. Uh, what we tend to have as well on these kinds of magazines are numbers. So we'll see undo years of damage in 15 minutes. So a quick fix there. 15,000 UK men open up about feeling down. So we have unusually here um, features to do with mental health as well as physical health. And then down there, we have 48 ways to boost testosterone. So if we look at our Z line, we see Chris Hemsworth's Thor workout, 
we draw a diagonal line from the top right of the page down to the bottom left, we see 48 ways to boost testosterone and swap fat for ripped. So we have these, again, it's called ideological violence, where the um, creator or the producer of the text constructs these ideologies that are used to create a subservient or a submissive audience. And then we have Whitner, winter fitness feasts, um, roast heads with gravy. I have no idea what that, what that means. Uh, so you'll see here we have lots and lots of representations of Chris Hemsworth um, as this kind of godlike uh, indicator of strength. We have the red um, text on the page with the blues and the greys, all of which are masculine colour codes. And um, we have the word bulletproof in grey as well, which keys in with that kind of bluey grey or gunmetal grey of Thor's t-shirt and also the blue bluey grey text on the page. Um, the colour red is used in men's health magazines as it tends to be a colour that encodes passion and action. So that's why red is used more in men's magazines than perhaps in women's magazines. However, if we look at our second representation of Chris Hemsworth here, this is GQ and this was a year later. So the men's health was 2017, this is 2018. And here we have Chris Hemsworth's badass feminist hero, super dad. And here we see, um, a much more vulnerable representation with again a direct mode of address but the camera is now at his eye level we have this soft blue background with the gold and the white so the colors are slightly more feminine or slightly softer um we have the words badass feminist hero super dad uh, indicating that this particular star is perhaps an ally to women and also um uh, an excellent father so we're trying to reshape what masculinity is very very different to the men's health magazine this one here is tying chris hemsworth to the women in his life and it is deliberate that his wedding ring is very prominent at the bottom of that z line so we're constructing a different role model here for the audience and then if we don't want to read that we also have antonia brown john c Riley, gucci main tom fraud pete davidson and jaden smith so we are offering that pluralistic representation of masculinity for the audience so you've got two examples there of how you could construct those representations of masculinity moving on now i'm going to show you beyonce so this again it's GQ, from I think 2016, um, maybe even slightly earlier, I think this was the year that she did the Super Bowl for the first time around, we see Beyonce here in a highly sexualized representation, so it would be a good idea to pause this now, go back to the representation theory, and look at how Beyonce is um, represented here, and look at this with reference to perhaps Gilroy, Van Zunen, Butler and hooks. So we see here just a slight revealing of the chest area underneath that t-shirt. We see the cut off football jersey indicating that she's wearing perhaps her boyfriend or her husband's t-shirt and jewellery. We see the very delicate belly chain um, which again just highlights that part of her body and then the red leopard print underwear which has obvious connotations of overt sexuality. We have the high key lighting on Beyonce with this direct address and the hair falling across the face with the parted lips. So we have a very heavily sexualized representation here. And we also have again, Kate Upton, Megan Fox, Mila Kunis, all your favorite Jessicas. Um, we have Dad's Gone Wild, Murder in the NFL. So this is a very, very different GQ to the Chris Hemsworth one that we looked at just then. So it's up to you whether you want to construct this very laddish, almost outdated now representation of masculinity or um, a slightly more up-to-date, slightly more restrained, slightly more well-informed representation of masculinity there. What I will say is if you're going to do something like GQ, try not to put a female star on your cover because it doesn't really play well with the examiners, but this is brilliant in terms of representation of gender, particularly when I show you how Beyonce wants to be represented now. So um, after this, magazine front cover was taken she obviously fell pregnant with blue ivy and from that point on her representation has slowly gained more and more agency this is a beyonce who does not have that agency or does not necessarily have that control over how she represents herself whereas here 
we have a woman who is very clearly in control and does not perform for the male gaze. So although we might have the revealing of the chest, we have also very, very heavy gold hoop earrings. We have heavily braided hair, so she's wearing overtly black hairstyles, uh, very minimal makeup, no false eyelashes, no flicked eyeliner like we did on the other front cover, and she is also wearing her own brand of sportswear, her Ivy Park Adidas um, branded sportswear, her collection, which was released last year. I personally think it looks like a Sainsbury's uniform, but that's just me. Uh, you'll also see we have the tropical plants in the background, um, which perhaps might reflect the fact that Beyonce is trying to portray a more natural um, version of herself. So she's definitely constructing a different version of herself now. You'll see the light is coming from behind her hair. So her chest is definitely not highlighted. Instead, her hair is highlighted. Um, once again, overtly referencing her African-American or her Creole heritage. And this does tie in a lot with what we've seen in the formation video. Um, what else did I want to show you? Ah, yes. So we were talking before about sex education. So if you wanted to do something along the lines of um, a British film aimed at 18 year olds, you might decide to do something like this film called Submarine, uh, which would be excellent for you to look at. I'll post the um, posters and materials up if I can find them. But here we have uh, Asa Butterfield who plays Otis Milburn in sex education. We have this very, very awkward, it looks like a school photo, um, hunched shoulders, slightly outdated t-shirt, um, slightly outdated background, um, messy hair, uh, and a mid shot, it looks like his hands are on his knees. This looked like a school photo. So something like this creates a very, very strong narrative of who this character is now, um, and also perhaps creates a version that the audience wants to root for throughout the film. So for an 18 year old audience, this would perhaps be the protagonist. I want to show you how you can also age up your star. It's very, very important that you do take the time to style your star. So this is also Asa Butterfield. And we'll see now that the hair, the mode of address, the clothes, the glasses, the background, the lighting are all completely different. He's wearing Gucci. He's wearing this kind of orangey red rusty colour. The hair is very clearly bleached and styled. Um, so again, this would create perhaps a different protagonist for the audience and an altogether different narrative for you to portray to your audience, depending on what messages you wanted to convey. Uh, in terms of BBC films, you've also got something like Blue Story. Um, so this is the teaser poster for Blue Story here. We see the graffiti background looking like posters have been ripped off a wall, so very much working class representation. We have both stars back to back but anchored. So we see that perhaps they are friends who have different paths or friends who have fallen out or, or whose loyalties lie with other people. We have very definite codes of urban streetwear. We have the zipped up hoodies, the hats, indirect mode of address and the lighting is from different angles so what we can tell in this picture is that these two stars were shot at separate times and then composited together so that is one way to work around the image requirement for the coursework then we have our third character down at the bottom who is making that direct address if we then look at the theatrical poster here which gives a bit more um context for the film we'll see the thames and the building sites in the background here we see um london signs i think it says peckham down there as well and we have more characters down here as well so we see se 13 se 15 for people that perhaps have the cultural competence we would understand that those are southeast london postcodes and perhaps one boy has moved away from their childhood home in order to pursue a new life. So we see it says Lewisham on the left in blue, and I think it says Peckham on the right in white, and we can see perhaps the rivalry that is going to build between these two characters. Okay, so that's basically what I, what I wanted to show you this week. I'm sorry this has been really rambly. Uh, by all means, like I said, slow it down, pause it, play it again, take notes. Uh, I'm here if you want to email me any um, anything that you want help with, I'm, I'm here for and I will uh, speak to you soon. Okay, bye.